So presumably here, Yahweh is being presented by one of his angels. And the fact the angel here is saying, come thou, implies to me that the angel of his presence was already in the ark. It was the angel who said, come into the ark, because the angel was in the ark beckoning them to come in. And then why do you think the angel of Yahweh was in the ark of the ark? Or might it just be Michael? He who is like Yah. And you see, there's a greater than Michael now, isn't he? Who is the prince who was like Yah and was in the likeness of Yah. And that is the Sua. And it's the Lord Jesus Christ now who is in the house. Yeah. It's him who says, Come unto me. In fact, he says those words in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all those who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you no rest. I will give you rest. This is an invitation from Jesus to come out from the seas of the Gentiles into the sanctuary of him. And when it's in Genesis 7, verse 2, it says that they will take him. The idea in the Hebrew means to seize or to snatch, and the equivalent word is used in Acts chapter 15 and verse 4. But it says in Acts 15 and verse 4, God snatches, he seizes, he takes the people for his name. And I have my suspicions, brothers and sisters, that those animals were divinely chosen to come into our work. After all, it says in John 10 verse 3, for the words of Jesus himself, the door is open. He calls them by their name to unfold into the house. These animals were chosen, and this is an objective in chapter 7, verse 3. The sole objective was simply to keep the seed alive. They wanted the seed of the land. This is the seed of the woman. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, it elucidates for us that in Adam all God, but in Christ, they shall be made alive. And by the way, the word keep them, you see in Genesis 7, verse 2, is the Hebrew word that means to quicken. They were quickened in him. And we only have to go to, well, to Matthew chapter 2, verse 13. But as those who are baptized into the ark are quickened and are aligned in Christ. So the separation from the seeds of the Gentiles and the ark of Christ, the ark of our Messiah, to keep them alive. And the animals now, chosen, snatched up, all come to the ark, all the herds, ponds, broods, bands, groups, flocks, corner animals, they all come into the door of the sanctuary. All different shapes and all different sizes and all different colours, brothers and sisters. Well, rather than you and I, we're all animals. And our acclaims as well. Some of the animals. But they're all coming into the ark. Animals. But I also note, actually, in chapter 16, verse 16, we know the dimensions of the ark and we know the dimensions of the window, but if you look at verse 16, we are given no dimensions of the door. We're not told the size of the door, because despite how much we feel we've sinned, despite how great a trauma we bear, 
God is always moving in the door of the heavens. A door that happens to be in the side of a ship or a boat that happened to be a tone for all around him. That was in the same figure of a cross or a crucifix or a stake. These idols walk through the door with no one options. And Ephesians 3, verse 17 to 18, explains to us, to us, if Christ dwells in us, only then will we understand the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth of God's love. And we all walk in together through the side of the door. And as they come into the darkness, they're able to see that in verse 14 and chapter 6 that there are rooms separated into this house. And so presumably all the different animals then disperse into the rooms that are allocated to them. But the word room there that you see in Genesis 6 verse 14 isn't the word room. It's the Hebrew word <coughs> nest. What a marvelous word for a place of life. Nests, places of refuge, places of nurturing, places of feeding, places of learning, places of looking after the young, places where you learn to fly, brothers and sisters. And they all go into their separate nests. And you see, it's in the ark where these animals go through a transformation. You know, if we were to look at Jude in verse 10, Jude obviously references the times what we're seeing here. And in Jude verse 10, he talks about those who are essentially outside of the ark. And he calls them brutes. In fact, he goes on to say not only they are brutes, but they are unreasoning, instinctive animals. That's how Jude describes those outside the ark. Unreasoning animals. Now, if you were to look at the word brute, and you look in your lexicon, you look in the Greek, Greek it means antinomios. It essentially means those who are without the word. And Jude says if you're without the word, then you're just like a wild animal. And what's fascinating is that we are created like animals. In fact, our very brains share that same creation. I find this fascinating that there are three parts of the human brain that function very similar to how an animal works. Now, we know the brain is highly mechanized, it's an incredibly sophisticated organism that we cannot even appreciate to understand. But loosely speaking, there are three parts of the brain. The first part of our brain is known as the reptilian mind. It's called that, brothers and sisters, we saw that brain. With a serpent. It controls the basic motor skills of our, of, of our function, controls our temperature, our reaction, and how we orientate, our survival skills, its vital flight. Hey, Lama, like, we go to zoos all the time, obviously. You go to a reptile house, and you go to a reptile house, and you stick there, and you wouldn't go in there, there, would you? But to the meaning part of the brain, which is the second part, well, this controls emotion, attention, reward. It's where we feel and it's where we remember. And, well, surprise, surprise, we share that part of our brain with mammals. Because you can teach a dog to do new tricks, not old ones. And well, just like a mammal, we take them in as pets. We care for them. You can take care for their young. Now, the next part of our brain is what separates us completely from the animal kingdom. It's known as the neocortex. And well, this is the human brain. This is where we learn language and comprehension and abstract thought. This is how we. Think of decision making, analysis, logical reasoning, it's all function through the human part of our brain. And we are created like this. There's a huge part of our brain that is animalistic. You see, 
We will be in there. We will be driving. And someone cuts us off on the road. Or we get angry. And we get fearful. Well, that's the brain stem, which is the reptilian part of our brain that has been activated. And that drives down the meaning part of our brain, which is emotion, which then drives our neocortex, which is language. And we lash out. It's all part of the animal brain. And the point is, brothers and sisters, this neocortex can be starved of oxygen and blood if that part of our brain is activated. And scientists tell us if we use and activate the animal part of our brain too much, it sabotages logical thinking. Romans tells us that the carnal mind is enmity with God. 2 Corinthians 2 tells us that the natural beast with all of his appetites and all his passions deceives the spirit. Psalm 73 tells us that man is like a wild beast. Genesis 3 compels us to crush the head of the beast that happens to be the serpent. It's the power of mind, brothers and sisters. No wonder Jews says that without the word you are like an animal. Because who is our new creation? How is new creation introduced in the Gospel of John? Well, John 1 tells us Jesus was the Logos. He's the intelligence, he's the purpose, he's the rationale. What could he do tells us to put on the mind of Christ? Only Jesus, brothers and sisters, can calm the animal man. It's for sure. Romans 12 tells us to renew our minds. And in Christ, the animal man can be tamed. And that's what it was told from the beginning. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, man was told to have dominion over the beast. And if he would have dominion, he would be in God's likeness. We see this played out in the Gospel of Mark, in chapter 5. Mark 5, we see a man with an unclean spirit. He's a magnet. He's a lunatic. Is this man in Mark 5? In fact, if you look at chapter verse 5, it says that no man could tame him. The idea to tame comes from the Greek to domesticate. This man was an undomesticated wild animal. They had to train him. He broke out of those trains. And his name was Legion. For he says we are many. And then, he sees the Logos. Do you know what he did? In his madness, in his psychosis, he runs to him. We talk about the need to bring the word made flesh, but what about the spirit of this man? Jesus had unbelievable intercourse with us. It's unreal. And what Legion needed at that moment was kindness. And he sees the world. He sees all of us. And he runs to him in verse 13. And if you notice, Jesus looks at this man, man. He looks at this wild animal. And he puts his hand upon him. And he casts out the evil spirits. So where does he put them upon? He puts them in wild beasts in the swine. And if you notice in verse 13, where do those wild beasts then run to? Tell me somebody. The sea. The sea of the Gentiles. Because that's where the wild beasts belong. They belong in the sea of the Gentiles. And then in verse 15, he looks, he opens, and it is in his right mind. It says in verse 15, in his right mind, he looks at Jesus. And he's not just looking at Jesus, brothers and sisters. He's looking at his own. And it says in 2 Corinthians 5 to be in Christ is to be altogether a new creature and lead in find that. The world crowned the animal. And he was in his right mind. And the world was ready to see the gentleness. And he was able then to walk in to Christ. So it's good point. It's no surprise to us that when we come to Genesis chapter 6, we don't see a description of animals walking into the ark. We see 
simply it's not people walking into the ark. Look at chapter 16, verse 19. Two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark. They came in male and female. If we do look at that phrase, male and female, we'll go right back to Genesis chapter 1, and it tells us there that that phrase is well there, those are cutting the wives, cutting the wives are looking into the ark. Notice in chapter 6 and verse 20, you'll see this repeated time and time again. After their kind, after their kind, after their kind, after their kind. When we go to Genesis 8 and verse 19, the word repurposes that word after their kind, after their kind, after their kind, and it tells us that they walk out as we have got husbands and wives walking into this heart of ark, hand by hand. And then we've got families, not species, walking into this ark and coming out of it. And if we were to look at Genesis 7, verse 7, we don't have husbands and wives, not only do we have families, it tells us in Genesis 7, verse 8, that of clean beasts, and of beasts that were not clean, of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth. And so we've got now clean and unclean. What? So I think this principle is laid out to us in Acts chapter 10, verse 11 and 12. Then we see Peter, he sees a vision, doesn't he, of a variety of different animals. In Acts chapter 10, verse 12, would you agree with us? It says that the animals that Peter saw in Acts 10, verse 12 are exactly the same as the animals that are unclean that walk into the ark in one shape. I see plenty of knots, because that's exactly true. Because the creatures that Peter sees in his vision are the same creatures of the unclean beasts that walk into the ark in Genesis 7 and verse 8. And Peter's been taught a valuable lesson here that the ark of Christ isn't just for the Jews. And to his absolute surprise, the ark is for the Gentiles, the unclean beasts. You know, when Peter went out to preach the gospel message to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10, verse 44, when he went to them, do you know what it says? It says, The Holy Spirit came upon them like rain. And then they were baptized into the ark. You know, if you put animals in certain cages with other certain animals, you'll know that they're very hostile to one another. And during this time, the two animal groups that were most hostile were Jew and Gentile. And what the Ark of Christ is telling us is that it can unite things of prejudice, creed, and color. Hostility is inoperated. The young clean and clean walk in, which is clearly speaking of those Jews and our Gentile friends. And so we see husbands walk in, we see wives walk in, we see families walk in, and we see our Jewish and our Gentile brothers and sisters walk into the ark. So I'd like us to focus in chapter 7, verse 14. On, well, the categories of these animals, because we are given quite a select group of categories. If you look at verse 14 of Genesis 7, we've got beasts, we've got cattle, we've got flying fowl, and we've got every creeping thing. Now, there's only, as far as I'm aware, there's only one other place in all of the Bible where these categories of animals appear together. Only one other place. It's in Psalm 148. Psalm 148 is a creation psalm. And in that particular psalm, you're going to find all of these groups and all of these categories brought together in a creation psalm. And if you're there, this is Psalm 148, you'll notice in verse 4 that the waters are mentioned. And you'll also notice in verse 7 that the deep is mentioned as well. So we're in the context of the language of the flood. Now, what Psalm 148 is going to show us, it's going to show us a, a piece of poetry, Hebrew poetry, called parallelism. What parallelism does, you get one passage of scripture, and in a sequence, the next passage is going to interpret the previous passage that goes before it. 
So if you look at Psalm 148, and you scan your eyes down to verse 9, and verse 10, 11, and 12, you'll notice that verse 9 corresponds with verse 10. And you'll also notice that verse 10 corresponds with verse 12, because it's using parallelism. So if we focus on our little creatures, the categories which appear in verse 10, you'll notice that those are the same categories that we saw in Genesis 7, verse 14. And what verse 12 is going to do for us is going to interpret who those categories of animals are. And so the beasts, well, they become young men. I do apologize for this. Because it's the cattle. Become the maidens. And it doesn't get any easier because the creeping thing <laughs> becomes the elderly. And the flying fowl, of course, they become the children. So they're not going to be like husbands and wives and family groups and Jews and Gentiles walking to the ark side by side, moving the abyss of the Gentiles into the ark of Christ in their separate rooms, but we also have. Young men, maidens, the elderly, the children, it looks as though the art takes for absolutely everybody. All richly filled with family life. Well, it's not until we go to the Epistle of Titus, in which Titus gives us a record of a creation of life, of a dynamic written by the hand of Paul through the Spirit. And Titus now is going to use those same categories of animals and he's going to give us a practical application for it in Titus chapter 2, verses 2 to 6. It's the same categories of animals this is, but in a spiritual form. This is the ecclesial life that's painted for us. Because in Titus 2, verse 2, tells us that our creeping elder brethren may walk in. And they sit down, and our younger brethren sit at their feet. The wild beasts, and those older brethren reflect upon a lifetime of tested faith, encouraging the young beasts to absorb their wisdom. And then there's our elder sisters. You think about family life and virtues <laughs> to their younger counterparts, the cattle. And the whole conversation is about raising their flying fowl. Children. That's the last. That's the last for the And you know, do you know what the whole conversation is about? The whole conversation in Titus 1 verse 9 is that they were holding upon the faithful robots. The word is calming the wild animal. And they're no longer leading their madness as we see in the Gentile cities. But the ark is a place of refuge, it's the nest in which the word is articulated from mouth to mouth, and it all comes from our older brothers and sisters. And if I can give anything to our older brothers and sisters as a man much younger, I still do. Your voice needs to be heard. It needs to sound. Because our generation needs it. That's the dynamic. And it says in Genesis 7, verse 16, and Yahweh shut the in. Michael closes the door, and Jesus now has the keys of death. And in Romans 8, and verse 4, there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ. The floods are here. And what began in AD 17, the flood of Rome, Luke 21, verse 25 tells us it's going to become the seas of nations roaring in their perplexity. And for 2,000 years, that ark has been sending the seas of the Gentiles 
explaining the entirety of the book of Revelation. Revelation is an exposition of Luke 21, verse 25. The Gentile sees. And we're right at the cross, brothers and sisters. We're right in Revelation 16. We're right at the end of the sixth vow. We're nearly there. We're just going to hold on. It is raining for 40 days and 40 nights in Genesis 7 and verse 12. As we know, it's the time period of a probation and a trial, and those rusty strength of thieves are the fire of the ark. And in the storm, what we begin to realize, what we begin to realize in this Gentile earth, is that this ark is a lemon. In solace. And in that vessel, God computed what he says in 2 Corinthians 5 is a new creation. We've got this amazing flood, a worldwide global flood. And in that worldwide flood, there is a colossal ark. And in that colossal ark, there is a multitude of life. And in that multitude of life, there's a little family huddled together. And in that family, there's a special son called Son. Which means the name. The name is preserved in a family that belongs to a multitude within the kingdom that is separated from the Gentiles. The name is the sister Him. Him. He is who we need to protect. Because it's Him who ultimately is protecting us. I'd like to remind you of the categories that go into the ark in Genesis 7 and verse 14. Genesis 7 verse 14. We remember that we've got these categories of animals, we've got the beasts, we've got the cattle, we've got the flying fowl, and every creeping thing. So, so clearly they walk into the ark. We'll make it work a little bit. But if you flip over to Genesis 8 and verse 17 to 20, You'll notice that exactly the same categories of animals then walk out of the ark. It's all the same. Even the creeping thing are remembered, the elderly. Everyone is remembered coming out of the ark. But there's one thing missing. You won't find in Genesis 8 as they come out of the ark the word unclean. And if they're not unclean, these beasts are no longer Gentile. And if they're no longer Gentile, brothers and sisters, we come out of the ark Jewish. Not natural Israel. We come out of spiritual Israel. These men were cleansed in the hope of Israel. They're clean. Coming out of the ark. The things change when we look at Genesis 9. And verse 18, so verse 9, so chapter 9, and verse 9 to 10. So if we just flip over one more page, this is now the eternal problem. So one of the more times, and everyone to remember the clean are all there, and the creeping things, the flying fowl, the beast, and all of that. And then you come to Genesis chapter 9, and we know this is the past the episode of the rainbow. And God says in this, I will establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast that is with you. I'd like to notice the phrase, living thing. Because that phrase, living thing, you'll know, appears in the book of Ezekiel in chapter 1. In fact, it occurs 11 times. It's the key word to the rock of Ezekiel 1. Well, Ezekiel 1, as we might know, is all about the vision of the future glory which we now call the multitudinous Christ. Ezekiel 1 is the saints in the kingdom. The multitude to come. Ezekiel 1, what is Ezekiel 1? And what we would know about Ezekiel 1 is that we have, well, the multitude representative as four faces, four animals. We just saw those animals on our bodies. 
Because the living creatures of Ezekiel 1 are going to be the four faces of the cherubim. The others happen to be four animals. Let's remind ourselves of them. There was man, there was the lion, there was the ox, and there was the eagle. This is the four faces of the saints. Here in Ezekiel chapter 1. It's fascinating that if you look at Genesis 9 and verse 10, you also have four animals mentioned. Four living creatures under the divine covenant for perpetual generations. We have Noah, which of course is the man. We have the birds, sleep of the eagle. We have the livestock, which is the ox. We have the beast, which I presume is speaking about the lion. So, under the coming to the actual generations after the command of the ark, what we need to realize is we've got the coming, we've got the saints here in Genesis chapter 9. And what's fascinating is that every time you see the saints mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 4, you'll always see them as something spectacular. What's with them? Who are they appearing with? Well, what are they appearing with? You'll always see them appearing with a rainbow. You go into the rainbow is here in Genesis 9, which just so happens to contain the very same categories of caravan creatures we see in Ezekiel 1 and our Revelation chapter 4. But there's one thing I'd like us to remember. We have a sequence of animals and categories that walked out. And they're both in your cult because we saw them in Genesis 8, verse 19, but there seems to be one category of animal that's missing here in Genesis 9, verse 9 to 10. Let's see one of the of those categories. We have man, we have beast, we have cat, we have plant, we have and we have the creeping things. The question is, what category is missing under the divine covenant for perpetual generations? You know what? It's the creeping thing. We must remind ourselves what the creeping thing spoke about in Psalm 148. Represented the old man. The old man. And what we're seeing here, one of the problems of Genesis 9, is the mortal people, a multitude to come, made. Immortality is the cherubim of Genesis 9, it's the rainbow of Ezekiel 1, it's the rainbow and the cherubim of Revelation chapter 4. We have now the multitude in its greatest manifestation, the immortal sense to come, glorifying the divine character of the Son. And incidentally, the phrase creeping thing appears in the Leviticus chapter 11. It should come as no surprise that it's an unclean beast. And more particular, the other creepy thing is an animal or a creature that is told to us that loves to crawl upon its belly. Now, in what creature was first or first to crawl upon its belly? It was the serpent. And the serpent now is no more. The creepy thing is no more. It's gone. It's vanquished. It's been taken away, the carnal thought, and death itself is no more. We've got the undying saints after their voyage in Jesus across the Gentile seas. You know, we only have to go to Job, the book of Job in chapter 33, and we see this teaching on life in. It was to prepare the way for the voice of God. The one who talks about death. He talks about the soul that enters the pit of Sheol. He talks about how flesh eventually is to rust away in its old age. He speaks about the distress of bones and helmets to the point that it begins itself to loathe bread. And in a life of his speech, and clearly in his distress, he says, But I have found a ransom. And the word ransom that the life you use is in Job 33, verse 24. Well, that just so happens to be the same word for pitch that's used with the ark in Genesis 6, verse 14. 
the life of the family of God. He found the refuge. He found the pit. He found the Messiah. And then the spirit of the Lord will change you. It is then said in verse 25, that in my despair, he will deliver my soul. Now, when he delivers my soul, the flesh that I bear shall become fresh with youth. And I shall return to the days of my youthful vigor. I don't know if you're anything like me, but there are certain brothers and sisters that I remember always in their old age. What was my life like right now? How many of those to tell you for this week? How many of those ones? How many friends? But what's remarkable is according to the speech of Job 33, those brothers and sisters are already are. And when we greet them again, we shall see them in the bloom of their youth. No longer look old. Because the creepy thing of mortality will be evaporated from them. She'll be deathless. Mortalized. Because they found a ransom. Now it's fascinating that when you look in the Hebrew, we have two arcs. We have the arc of the in Genesis and we. It was like the lack of the covenant in Exodus. So I've tried for those sisters, you know, I've tried to see the link between the two words and then, well, they're completely different. Two completely different words. However, in the Greek, they're the same. The ark of the covenant and the ark of Noah in the New Testament Greek, they're the same word. Because it's all about who, who brings it all together. And so when we're looking at the Ark of the Covenant, and we're looking at the Ark of Noah, well, through Jesus, they're the same thing. And what was the Ark of the Covenant? Well, we know what the word is in the Hebrew, it's the word Rome. The word Rome is the same word for coffin. It was a sarcophagus, they call it. But in its remarkability, it's also, ironically, a box that speaks of resurrection. A coffin of resurrection was the ark. And I believe in the New Testament is telling us that the, the ark of Noah serves exactly the same purpose. And I think that's absolutely true, because, well, you only have to go to 1 Peter 3, verse 21. It tells us there that the ark was a figure of baptism. And Romans 6 tells us that we are buried in Christ. This was the boat. This was a tomb. On the seas of the Gentiles, a floating sarcophagus across the abyss, crossing the voyage of the seas to go beyond the grave. That's where this boat, this sarcophagus is going. And death doesn't just have to be a spiritual one in Christ, but in Adam, is death is a natural one. We should be saying, those who fall asleep, you know, just as Adam and Jesus were put in an actual sleep, it wouldn't be unwise to suggest, would it? It wouldn't be unwise to suggest that some of those animals that went into the ark fell into the deep slumber of hibernation. A sink. So a clear explanation. And we then to wait to the use of life when the ark was open. Why did that make sense? Because after all, it was Job who fell asleep in the side of a ship, and it was Jesus too who fell asleep in the side of a ship in the middle of a storm. It seems to me that everyone was in a thick fell asleep. And both those incidents speak of death and of resurrection. And I don't think it's wise to suggest that some of the animals in their natural instincts and their inclinations fell asleep in the ark. In 
you look at Genesis 7, verse 23, God knows that those animals were alive. And as my father said to me, when my father's mother passed away, you can only sleep when you are alive. Death is just a sleep. And it's easier for the clouds to wake the corpse on the earth than it is for a father to make his sleeping child in the morning. Sometimes. Nevertheless, that not even death is an enemy too strong. Even death is vanquished in the crossing over the waters. Many of us have been attending this school for a very long time. And we've got to know many brothers and sisters over those years. Acquaintances that we've seen and built friendships with. Many of them have come into the ark of the refuge, into the sanctuary. And now are blissfully fast asleep when the ark comes to his life. It does not swear the destiny of Israel. The destiny is Israel. Dry land. And we may know these existence because the times of the Gentiles are coming to a conclusion. The flood of the Gentile earth has been here for 2,000 years. And if we only look at Genesis chapter 7, we'll see this phrase that appears time and time again, or four times to be exact. It says that the waters prevailed over the earth. These are the Gentile nations who prevailed themselves over Israel, who prevailed themselves over Jerusalem. And in chapter 8, Yahweh has his say, because he says in chapter 8, verse 1, they were pacified. In verse 2, in verse at three, they were living and restricted. In verse 3 and verse 5, they were retreated and they were bereaved. The waters in verse 8 and 11 were abandoned, they were despised. In verse 13, they were slain. That's all again. It's the end. They were laid waste. There's going to be a time soon which we have to believe in faith. And we are for ourselves that the doors of Seal will open and we will see our loved ones again in a time where the nations are calmed. Those who are alive and asleep when Jesus returns will all walk out of the ark together, transformed, immortalized in a new world to come in which Israel is restored. Now, I've come to this. I've got two things. First, I'll Turn them to Isaiah chapter 11. This is a vision, of course, of the kingdom when Jesus returns to Mount Zion. Now we know that there are four beasts that represent the kingdom of God, or four animals that represent the kingdom of God, which is the face of the kingdom. But we also have four beasts that represent the kingdom of men, or the kingdom of man. And we recognize those four beasts. They're the leopard, the bear, the lion, and the unknown serpent dragon beast of Revelation chapter, of Revelation chapter 13. And we see the development of these beasts, because they're all brought together in the system that's going to eventually oppose Jesus. And just as the beast rose out of the sea in Daniel chapter 7, the Christian false beast in Revelation chapter 13 also rose out of the seas. This is the beast of the sea, brothers and sisters. This is what opposes the saints. Four of them. In Isaiah 11, we're going to see now those same beasts mentioned when Jesus returns. In fact, if you look at chapter 6, verse 6 to 10, we've got a whole description of them. Can you spot them? In Isaiah 11, because they're there somewhere, and they're no longer aggressive. It means they But they are tame. The beasts of Revelation. 
the pros the sense. The knowledge of our love and our calm. They'll be calm, brothers and sisters, because they're responding to Jesus. And they're being held by Jesus and subdued. Binding. And Isaiah 2 tells us that the aggressive nations so shall learn war no more. And if you look at verse 9, it tells us that the earth shall be full of the knowledge of Yahweh. What's that word in its equivalent of a phrase in the Greek? Everyone that begins to understand the logos. The word is calming the nations of the storm in Isaiah 11, verse 9. And then in verse 10, it says that this was in place. Shall be glorious. And the word rest in place, that you see there in Isaiah 11, verse 10, is the word Noah. Jesus shall come in the sign of Noah, and in his return he shall mark the rest of the earth on that sign. And all the animal nations are subdued, and they're found, dear brothers and sisters, in the remnants of a receding flood. 